Hi there. Come on in. Welcome to our first show of 1991. I think you'll agree that judging by this kickoff, it's going to be a heck of a year coming up in Michigan Outdoors. Our Outdoor Classic this week takes us to Sixth Street Dam in Grand Rapids, fishing for steelhead trout with Bob Garner, who also has lots of praise for a unique recipe called Saucy Squirrel Manicotti. And the man still loves his wild game dishes. And in just a moment, we'll begin the year with our hard-hitting results from my preliminary investigation of the DNR's management of our deer herd. This is an important issue, a serious issue I'm going to need your help to solve. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. I've been getting more mail on the 1990 deer season than on any issue in the 10-year history of this show. These letters and all the calls I've gotten focus on the fact that sportsmen don't believe the DNR's estimate that Michigan had 1.8 million deer going into the 1990 hunting season, and they think the DNR has done a lousy job of implementing block and crop damage permits. There's no doubt in my mind that what sportsmen have documented in these letters is true because I've checked it out. And it appears that we're not dealing with a faulty deer census technique or a bad block permit system. What we're dealing with is a DNR that has not assigned enough personnel in wildlife management and law enforcement to get the job done right. Here's some of the problems I've uncovered. The DNR Wildlife Division has 22 vacancies in its field staff that won't be filled. Secretarial and clerical staff who used to work full-time for wildlife biologists have had most of their time reassigned to environmental issues. Conservation officers have been told in some districts not to do fish or game work at various times even if they encounter violations because their daily work logs must reflect concentrated efforts on marine safety, ORV, and environmental investigations so that the DNR will qualify for certain federal grants. The DNR had more conservation officers in the late 1940s than it does today. Some wildlife biologists in key parts of the state didn't have time this summer to visit farms and issued thousands of block and summer crop damage permits without verifying a need. Now let me take a moment to explain the various licenses you can get for deer. For $12.85, you can buy a buck tag for firearm season. Another $12.85 buys you an any deer tag for archery season. And you can buy additional buck tags for both firearm and archery at $12.85 each. Now everybody can buy these four licenses. Then for $3 you can apply for a bonus antlerless permit. I got one here for my area. This entitles the holder to take an extra deer, but it has to be antlerless. The DNR gave out 300,000 of these in 1990. Then there are block permits. 25,000 were distributed to landowners at $3 each. These were extra permits for antlerless deer only on land that had crop damage. And these permits had to be used by licensed hunters during hunting season. There's another permit that's given for free during the summer to farmers who have crop damage due to deer. The DNR issued thousands of summer crop damage permits. Farmers and their friends were allowed to shoot does and fawns during the summer, sometimes at night with lights and the farmer could give the deer to anybody he wanted or let them lay. DNR personnel have also let me see documents that showed the following. Falsified, modified, or negligently issued crop damage permits, even to individuals who had a history of deer shooting violations. Lists of farmers automatically issued crop damage and block permits without verification that the farms are in operation or the farmer is still alive. Block permits issued to landowners who don't farm, don't have crop damage, and who own as little as one and a half acres. Another problem is that Michigan does not have a wanton waste law that requires the utilization of game. Conservation officers can't write tickets to people who shoot deer, stack them to rot under these crop damage permits, or who shoot them and let them lie in the fields. Conservation officers and sportsmen have written me about numerous incidents when this has happened. The problem here really is politics. Money and staff have been diverted away from fish and game and to environmental and other non-wildlife concerns. Sportsmen and the wildlife resources in this state are being neglected by a DNR that's apparently too big to be concerned about fish and game. Wildlife Chief Carl Hosford should be a leader in this crusade but his contract is renewed yearly by DNR upper management. If he advocates splitting the DNR or points out where funds are being misspent, he'll be replaced within months. 
Watch how uncomfortable he is when I ask him about splitting the DNR and giving sportsmen back our Department of Fish and Game. Used to be in the old days of the Natural Resources Commission, they talked for a whole day about hunting and fishing issues. Now they have two-day meetings and slough off hunting and fishing in a moment and spend all their time on landfills, mm -hmm. toxic wastes. Uh, it doesn't seem like the, the DNR is giving the Wildlife Division enough attention. Well, we, we would like all the attention we could get. But in all fairness, in those days when the wildlife received more attention, you did not have uh, the same department you had today. Yeah, but you do admit that the, that the wildlife does not receive the attention that it had, right? Or fisheries. We do not uh, take up the commission agenda as we once did, no. Wouldn't it be nice if maybe, maybe because some changes could be made in the coming year or two whereby we could get back to some more attention on fish and wildlife? Well, let's look at it from another angle. Maybe the commission should focus on problems and maybe wildlife isn't where the problems are. You just slipped that question totally. Wouldn't it be nice? Thank you. Wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if we had a commission that was devoted just for fish and wildlife? Maybe a department of fish and game? Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> you would like it, wouldn't you? Everybody involved with, with wildlife. The governor would, has voted out. Like, the wouldn't... governor's voted out. Don't worry, Carl. <laughs> that system is gone now. Wouldn't it be nice? If, if wildlife, fish and wildlife were up there with, a, with more identity, more power, more attention? Well, let me uh, answer that with what little diplomacy a wildlife chief can muster. And that is, we would love all the attention and all the support we can get because we think our hunters and our trappers and our wildlife enthusiasts deserve all the attention we can put on it. And deserve more. They <laughs> did. Yeah, that is a very biased DNR. opinion. Uh -huh. Yes, they deserve much more. They deserve everything as far as we're concerned. That's our business. Carl Hosford doesn't have civil service protection. And if he doesn't defend the DNR bureaucracy, he's out of a job. But what about all the other lower level DNR employees who do have civil service protection? Well, the people who have given me information, inside information about the DNR, have said I can't reveal the source, I can't reveal their name, because a number of things could happen. They could get a new assignment in Timbuktu. DNR policy says that an employee may be immediately relocated to another part of the state if relocation is in the best interest of the department. They could be given less desirable work duties such as marine safety, ORV patrol, checking wells, waste haulers, and landfills. Their equipment could be reassigned to another employee such as a boat or snowmobile needed in fish and game work. And definitely they'd be denied promotions in favor of less controversial employees. So here I am, investigating the management of the DNR, and employees are afraid to talk to me. They'll show me documents, but they make me agree not to reveal their names or where these documents came from. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Carl Hosford, on this show, agreed to hold public meetings with the Outdoors Club so that sportsmen can air their grievances about the deer season in the Wildlife Division. I've decided to cancel those meetings. There's no point. The DNR knows where the problems lie. It's been politics and lack of communication within the DNR and with the public that has left fish and game management in a mess. The answer is legislative hearings. Now, we have a new governor in the state, and hopefully a new era in state government has already begun. I hope so. But if you feel strongly about management of the DNR and the deer herd, pro or con, the best thing you can do right now is to write a letter to your local representative and to your senator. Tell them you'd like the legislature to hold hearings on how the DNR is managing sportsmen's money, the fish, wildlife, and law divisions, or tell them that you like things the way they are, if that's how you feel. And send a copy to the governor. Your letters right now could make the difference between these problems being looked at objectively or swept under the rug. In 10 years doing this show, I've never personally asked sportsmen to write letters to your legislators because frankly, I haven't had all that much faith that a lot of these letters do all that much good. But this one will, especially if a lot of you write. If you have an opinion, pick up a pen and voice that opinion. Now is the time. 
from the 1989 deer season, Norbert Denhoff from Casanova bagged this 12 point with his muzzleloader in Chippewa County. And from Iron County came this 10 point taken by local Walt Chowski from Crystal Falls. And Mackinac County produced this 11 point for Kevin Monte from St. Ignace. From Little Bay Denock, a November 1st walleye, 12 and a half pounds, 31 and a half inches long by Dwayne Hoffman from Gladstone. 10 days later, Randall Carlson from Gladstone caught this 31 incher that weighed almost 10 pounds. Jigging the Saginaw River a year ago, the day after Christmas, Mike Lefebvre from Cairo caught this 28 inch walleye on a Rapala. Taxidermist John Hook from Oscoda, who's an excellent fisherman to boot, caught this 31-inch, 12-and-a-half-pound walleye from the Osable on December 10th. With a 20-pound, 38-inch lake trout, here's rookie ice fisherman Jeff Marshall from Livonia. Yeah, I married into a uh, ice fishing family about five years ago and got involved with uh, fishing, and what do you know, I got my... Am I uh, lying down where it doesn't belong, supposedly, 25 feet down in 70 foot of water and pulled out this thing, uh, bigger than I've ever seen. Did you fish before you got married? Uh, just at the grocery store. <laughs> so you didn't fish at all? I mean, there's a lot of people that would marry into a family and find out it's a nice fishing family and say, whoa, yeah. this is great. You know? Well, early ice this year allowed uh, the family to get out there before the first of the year, and uh, we got reports for three or four weeks of good fishing, so this was caught two days before Christmas this year, and Jan Morris up in uh, Houghton Lake has got this thing uh, being mounted right now, so that's why I've only got this picture, but uh, pretty exciting stuff for a rookie. A Higgins Lake trophy for Jeff Marshall, our Michigan Outdoors Rookie Ice Angler of the Week. The name of this river spans the entire distance across the southern lower peninsula. On the eastern half, it's a famous road that stretches to Detroit. On the western side, this water course is the famous Grand River itself. And where this river gently tumbles to a lower elevation, the town was aptly named Grand Rapids. The Sixth Street Dam can be seen from the business district. The site of a fish ladder, a series of pools that salmon and steelhead trout can jump to bypass that downtown dam. And fish use this ladder year round. I don't either, but just a couple of guys over there, and that's it. A week ago, Bob Garner donned his waders to join John Hesse from Lansing on a midwinter fishing expedition for steelhead trout. Bob, maybe before we get in here, we ought to talk about where the fish hold a little bit. Now here below the dam, it's deep water and very turbulent water, and a lot of the spawn fishermen fish up here and uh, right off the face of the dam. They're standing in this rocky area and cast up in there. But, the, but that's treacherous water. This white water in the undertow here has got to be awesome. It is very dangerous, uh, and I generally stay away from that area. Uh, it's very hard just to hold your balance in, a, in those rocks there, and, and I just don't feel comfortable with it. A lot of people do it and catch fish. So I think we'll start out here, and there's an area that runs down through the center of the river uh, that's a little deeper, and we call it center run, and we'll, we'll work our way out to that and then just along the, this east or west edge. The steelhead trout are here, not in the slower water under the bridge, but stacked up in the faster water near the dam. John Hesse fishes steelhead far more than the average angler, and he's especially accomplished at the ins and outs. Sometimes the best way to enter here is just to sit out and get there. Although this might look like any other fishing trip for trout, I have to caution you about the danger of this fast, cold water. Winter fishing like this in open water is, is more than hazardous. To tolerate the cold, you have to wear long underwear, plenty of warm clothing, you're not as nimble in these temperatures as you would be in the summer, and falling in 36 degree water can be fatal in a short period of time. It's nothing to toy with, and Bob Garner is extremely cautious as he battles the current against his legs and the slippery rocks under his boots. Steelhead trout like the fast current. Actually, they like to hang along the edge of it in deep runs and pockets that are just below the spillway. 
It's a matter of minutes before Bob Garner hooks one, which twists and fights using the current as leverage against the fishing rod. John Hesse is the net man, but you can see that John expects this fish to swim into the net. Backhanding the net across his body doesn't give him much power on this uncooperative fish. <laughs> How do you take off your glove? Hang on to your fishing rod, keep your balance in an icy stream, and net a spunky rainbow trout all at the same time? Well, it's not easy. This fish takes Bob Garner around 360 degrees as John bobbles his fishing rod, thinking now's the time it will slide into the net. This fish is a rainbow trout that grew to a large size because it migrated to Lake Michigan for a couple years, eating alewives, chubs, and smelt. These migrating rainbow trout are called steelhead by anglers and bringing one to the net is a mighty accomplishment. Bob Garner can be proud not only of that fish, but of getting out and back with a dry pair of britches. With a little firmer underpinning, Bob and John can take a good look at the steelhead that gave him such a tussle. Well, we got a real champ here. Bob did a nice job on that. Yeah, yeah, well, the big assist, too. Beautiful. What do you think of that? about nine pounds. I'll put the stringer on him first and then I'll hold him up for Okay. We'll, we'll do that. We'll make sure we got a hold of him. <laughs> you can see the pink rainbow stripe down its side, but it's a dark steel head on its last spawning run. It went for John Hesse's favorite lure, a homemade spinner, a lure he fishes with almost exclusively. The MEPS spinner type is a classic. Using a homemade spinner, a MEP style spinner, and uh, it's a fluorescent color chartreuse that the steelhead rod like a lot. A weighted spinner that's a whole lot like a real uh, a MEPS, but we make our own. It only costs about 25 cents a piece, so we can afford to lose a bunch. Not a lot to it. You don't tie a snap and swivel on; just tie directly onto the line. And, uh, you try to get it into the current and just let the current bring it across the run real slowly and the fish will come up behind it. In this winter weather, the water's cold and the fish aren't as active, so you want to reel quite slowly and they'll chase it to some degree, but you got to get it right in front of them if you can. Rarely will you find any food in a steelhead stomach in the winter. They don't eat, but they seem to strike out of instinct and taunting a steelhead with a spinner goads it into striking. That's all an angler needs if his hooks are sharp. This actually is the third steelhead these two have taken in a half hour. There he is. My leg's here. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. Let me get up. Oh, he's pretty. Okay. Whoa. I came close to all right. All right. Nice what about eating steelhead trout like this? John Hesse loves them, and so does his family. But what about the chemical contamination? John says properly trimmed, he doesn't see any problem, and he ought to know. He studies toxic contamination in fish for the Michigan Department of Public Health. Nice day. Oh, they got a lot of nice color in them. John often turns a few steelhead back each trip, and after he has one for the table, he says steelhead taste far better right out of the water, so he'll catch and maybe eat this one another day. Midwinter fishing can be a lot of fun, but remember, it's always dangerous to some degree. And if you're not up to trying that yourself, well, just get in your car, drive to 6th Street Dam, and watch the anglers fish for steelhead. That's where fishing can be a spectator sport. Now, eating can be a spectator sport, too, when Bob Garner tackles Kathy Beitler's wild game recipes. Tim Major sent us a saucy squirrel manicotti, and it's an Excellent way to fix squirrel. Excellent. It's beautiful, too. Look at it. <laughs> yes, well, it is. Oops, until we got to the squirrel. You know, the trouble is, squirrel, when you get it late in the summer and it's been in the freezer, 
sometimes doesn't look quite so appetizing on the plate. Right. No problem, though. Yep. We're Just going to boil the dickens <laughs> out of it. <laughs> and then take it off. And you are going to use manicotti shells. And you want to pre-cook these, parboil them, actually, about three to six minutes. And you only want to do a couple at a time because if you put more than that in a pan, they will stick together and they get real gummy and then it's a real mess trying oh. to get them apart. So, so it's kind of a, a skill here in right. boiling it these takes, yeah, it, manicotti Yeah, it takes shells. time, but um, that's the way you want to do it. Yes, cheese, a filling huh? of yep, minced onion, cream, cream sauce, mm -hmm. uh, milk, mushrooms, parsley, and salt and pepper. Hmm. And just going to mix this all up thoroughly. And then once the squirrel is cooked and you, you can take it off the bones, you're going to go ahead and add about two cups to so, uh, the sauce. Sometimes a cream cheese in a recipe. I'm going to be interested to taste this. Because sometimes, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes it tastes kind of odd to me. <laughs> it does. Oh, I think it's very good but in it this recipe. But it looks good. And then you're going to uh, fill the manicotti shells once you can work with them a little bit. And they... They've been parboiled. Uh, hmm. Just fill them with a filling. It looks like a good filling that you could use maybe even on a sandwich. Sure. Well, absolutely. Maybe, maybe, with, maybe with mayonnaise instead It'd of cream cheese. Be good with cheese. crackers. Mm -hmm. it with would ma be. How about mayonnaise instead of cream cheese? Sure. That? Would that work? Yeah, that would work. Okay. And then going to make a cheese sauce. And this is just a package of uh, cheese sauce that you can buy at the grocers uh, mixed with milk and then poured over the hmm. top. Like Velveeta? Or? Uh, no, it's actually like a gravy sauce. Hmm. And then Parmesan cheese on top and it goes back in the oven covered because you don't want your shells to dry out. I'll be darned. Well, this, of course, he was a winner with his hot and sour bass soup mm -hmm. in our cooking contest. And this one, this squirrel manicotti, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to like it. I, Garner, though, I bet you he's going <laughs> to love it. Anybody tries this, this squirrel recipe because it is delicious. It is a good thing that the limit's five a day. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, we deplete the woods of squirrels. This, <laughs> this recipe is absolutely delicious. I love pasta and noodles, all that sort of stuff. No Roll kidding. it in with... <laughs> <laughs> All right, makes sport to me, but I'll tell you, pasta noodles, and you roll it in with squirrel, which may very well be the best tasting meat mm -hmm. in all the outdoors. Oh, it's it is tremendous. Mm -hmm. This is tremendous. Try this on a kid. Okay. Yeah, I think kids Speaking like of it. kids. Yeah. How come this tastes like soap? A this what? Reminds me, this reminds me of when I was a kid. I always had my mouth washed out with soap. I know you have you deserve trouble it. believing it. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not, this does, what not is the it least. Here? It reminds me of soap. I mean, I don't... It's a consistency with a little cream cheese and all that. Cream cheese? Plus, yep. there were many of us who never did get our mouths on our stuff. So you're so going to love know. it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of feel I'll like... I'll tell you what. Let me play it this I way. I feel like I've said something funny here. If you weren't foul-mouthed throughout your whole life, try this recipe. You're going to love it. <laughs> If you like cream cheese, you'll love this recipe or substitute sour cream. You can always use domestic meat instead of game. That always works. This Well, right around the corner is Tip Up Town USA. The third week in January, we'll be up there with our cameras fishing on the ice. Remember, even in lakes that are big and apparently safe, there are always some thin spots. So make sure if you're ice fishing on a lake or a river that you know the waters or stick to areas you know are absolutely safe. Don't monkey with your safety out doors. Now for those of you who want to express your opinion on the DNR's management of fish and game, write a letter to your local representative and senator. And if you already know his or her names, this is the address where you want to send your letters. Also, send a copy to Governor Engler. We'll be trying to get him on the show as soon as we can to find out what he's going to do for sportsmen in the next four years. Now when you're all done writing, be sure to get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week by Domino's Pizza, the originator of a nonprofit foundation chartered to conduct wildlife habitat projects on the public land of Drummond Island. Domino's, committed to the environment. And by the financial support of viewers like you. Oh, it's a crappie. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, you can sit back and listen to some ice tales. Stories about ice fishing over the years that didn't turn out as we had hoped. They weren't necessarily funny at the time, but I'm sure you'll find them amusing. I'm sure we'll also have reactions and additional information about the DNR controversy, along with our regular features. So join me next week right here on Public TV.